All right. Good morning, everybody. Can you guys uh, hear me okay? All right. It's been a while since, you know, I'm used to preaching in the, uh, in the park, so I feel like we've come back to the 21st century up here. <laughs> Strange uh, making sure I talk into the mic, but just let me know. So in case you haven't guessed, the um, title of my sermon today is Mercy, Not Sacrifice. And my name is Kyle Popick. I'm married to Hallie Popick, sitting back there in the middle. And if you've been coming with us here to Shoreline Church for any length of time, we've been doing a series called Religion Versus Relationship. And the point of the series has really been to overall examine what does God really want, right? What is the difference of having a true relationship with God versus just living in some type of religion? And so my sermon is going to be a continuation on that theme. Hopefully it's something that's a little bit newer for you guys and keep it fresh for everybody. Um, but that's what I'm going to be speaking in today. If you'd like, you can go ahead and turn. We're going to get started in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9 through uh, 13. I'll give you guys a second to turn there, and then I'll go ahead and open us up with a word of prayer. All right, Father God, I just thank you for this time, Lord. I just pray that you would just really just speak the message that you want spoken, Lord, that it would be your words and not mine to the church here today. God, I just pray that you would cause um, just your spirit to move in the hearts of each person as they've come today with whatever they need, with whatever they bring, Lord, that it would just be refreshing to them. Amen. All right, starting in Matthew chapter nine, verse nine says this. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When Jesus saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Okay. So we're going to start here, and what I want to lay out the land a little bit is let's back up. This is Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. So it's still early in Jesus' ministry. And at this point in time, he started preaching for a little while, but he's still relatively new on the scene. So people are trying to figure out who this carpenter turned preacher is and what he's trying to accomplish. And so early on in his ministry, he approaches a man named Matthew who happened to be a tax collector. And he invites Matthew to come and follow him. Matthew gets up and does so. Now, if that seems a little bit strange to you, it's actually not, it didn't happen quite the way that we, we get the highlights in the text. That's not exactly the way it went. It wasn't like Jesus just walked up to a man he didn't meet. Matthew and Jesus, by this time of their life, would have actually known each other for a little while. And as well, in the ancient Judea, it was a pretty common practice for things like this to happen. Because the way that the ancient Judaic religion was structured is you would have rabbis, which translates to teacher. And what these rabbis would do is they would invite disciples to come and follow them, which translates to students. And so basically, in the ancient Hebrew culture, if you decided to become a disciple of a rabbi, you decided to leave your previous life, and you followed them as they went on their itinerant preaching routes, and you dedicated your life to understanding your particular rabbi's perspective on the Torah and the Talmud, and you would teach it after them after they were gone. So for Jesus to come up, a rabbi, and invite someone to become one of his disciples is actually a pretty common thing in the ancient world. And so sometime after that, what Matthew does is he invites his friends to come over to Jesus's house for a meal so they can meet the new man that he's dedicated to become his rabbi. And I don't know, I don't know how late the party might have gone. I don't know how, how they might have been, but they catch the attention of some Pharisees. And if you don't know who the Pharisees are, I want to take a look into them now. But I want to take, before we get into the interaction, I want to take a look at the character of the two groups that we have at play in this story. Because you have the Pharisees on the one side and the tax collectors on the other. And just to give you a little context into who they were as a people group in ancient Judea, the Pharisees were the elite of Israel. There were four main dominant religious Jewish groups during Israel's, during Jesus's day in ancient Israel. And the Pharisees were one of the two most dominant of those four. Now, they were also famous because they had the strictest laws, they had the most uh, rigid duties in terms of their religion, and the highest standards in terms of outward performance. And because of these very high standards, they gained a lot of acclaim and exaltation from regular everyday Jews in their society. So they were the rock stars, they were the movie stars, they were the you know, pro athletes of their day. And just to give you an idea, if you wanted to become a Pharisee, just to give you an idea of some of the dedication that you had to undergo, if you were dedicated to become a Pharisee as an infant, at two years old, they would have you do the honey lick. 
And what that was is they would take a scroll and they'd write a portion of the Torah on the scroll. Then they would dip that scroll into a jar of honey and have the infant Pharisee lick the honey off the scroll so that their first interaction with the word of God might be how sweet it is. Then they had the entire Torah memorized word for word by the time they were 10. So if you don't know what the Torah is, it's the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And by the time they were teenagers, they would memorize the Psalms and the prophets. So Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Amos, Nahum, Micah, Habakkuk. You get the idea. They had a lot, almost all, of the Old Testament memorized by the, before they were 20 years old. And today's Sunday, I'm sure probably you probably tithe online before you came. But if you were a Pharisee, you didn't just tie the tenth of your income. You would go into your sock drawer, count out a tenth of your socks, and tithe your socks. You would go into your spice drawer, break out your cinnamon, and tie the tenth of your cinnamon. They tied a, they tithed a tenth of all their possessions, not just income. They also fasted twice a week, and they kept the prayer hours every single day, every day, regardless of where they were. This isn't everything they would do. They had hundreds and hundreds of laws, even down to how you were to wash your hands before meals. But that just gives you the idea of the kind of rigidity and the kind of intensity they carried with them in their faith that earned them a lot of respect in the society. Now, on the complete opposite side of that, you have the tax collectors. The tax collectors were easily the most hated people group in ancient Judea by other Judeans. And the reason why for that was simple is the tax collectors, they were the hand, they were the arm, and they were the symbol of Roman oppression in ancient Judea. Because during the Jesus' lifetime, Rome had conquered Palestine. And Rome, they had a pretty hands-off policy when it came to countries they conquered. They really only had two rules. Don't revolt and pay us our taxes on time. And as long as you did that, they leave you be. You can have whatever religion you want. You can, you can govern yourselves. As long as we get our money on time, we're all good. And what they would do is they would hire local citizens to become their tax collectors. And what these local citizens figured out is that they could charge more than Jewish citizens really owed and keep the difference. And Rome knew this was going on and they actually encouraged it, right? Because after all, if their tax collectors have a little extra incentive to go collect taxes, Rome gets paid all the quicker. But so just to put that into perspective of how the Pharisees would have felt about the tax collectors, we live in America today, right? We're not conquered by anybody, but let's imagine that right now we're occupied, right? Some other country invades us and let's say they nominate Logan and let's say they nominate Evan, and let's say they nominate Jenica to become tax collectors, right? And these people that you've known for years, these people that you've spent time with for years, you fed and cared for for years, show up at your door and charge you 400% of what you owe. And it's actually pretty timely because tax season is coming up. I'm sure none of you are happy about it. But imagine if you had to pay, you know, quadruple. Imagine, and you know it's fraud. They know it's fraud. We all know it's fraud, but you have nothing you can do but pay it. Otherwise, those centurions are going to come knocking down your door. And so when the Pharisees, the religious elite of Israel, see this new man who's a carpenter who they have disdain for because he hasn't gone through the training they've gone through, keeping company with such types of people and yet claiming to preach the message of God, that seems off to them. There's a disconnect there. And they ask the disciples, why does your teacher keep such company? And Jesus does two things in his response back to them. Now, we're only going to look at one. There's just not enough time in the day to look at both. But I at least want to touch on the first one so that you're aware of it, and then we'll focus on the second. The first thing Jesus does in his answer to them, he does in his, the first two verses where he says, you know, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous. I've come to call sinners. Remember, I told you, Jesus was, this was early on in his ministry. He's still trying to announce why he's come. So he uses this moment to do so in front of everybody. He has an audience. And so he basically says, hey, why has God come in the flesh? Why has a son of man come to earth? To extend repentance to those who want to take it. That's a sermon for another day. We're not going to focus on that part of it. What I want to focus on is that line in the middle, because after he answers the Pharisees question, he turns it around on them and he turns it around on them with the phrase, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And so in order to, excuse me, sorry, I'm getting over a little bit of a cold, so I apologize if I sniffle under the mic. But what I want to do for the rest of this sermon is we're going to do what Jesus said to do. We're going to go and learn what he meant by quoting that phrase, because that phrase, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Jesus quoted that from the book of Hosea, chapter six, verse six. 
And in Matthew, when you read the chapter, the gospel of Matthew was written to a largely Jewish audience. So the story stops there because to a Jewish audience, they would have understood the implications that Jesus meant in that phrase. It would have been automatically retained. We don't have that same context. So we're going to do what Jesus said. We're going to go and learn. And one cool thing I found when I was researching this sermon, that phrase go and learn is not randomly inserted. Remember how I told you that in the ancient Jewish religion, it was structured how rabbis would gather their disciples and then train them. Well, whenever they were going to train their disciples on a new piece of scripture and build arguments off of it, they would start that process with the phrase, go and learn. So when Jesus tells the Pharisees, go and learn, he's literally taking them back to school and he's taking the position of being their rabbi. Excuse me, just give me one moment. All right, and so that's what we're going to go and do. What I, the question that I want to look at, you guys, right? We're talking about religion versus relationship. And the question I want to ask is, what is Jesus trying to point out in the Pharisees' heart? And why, of all places where he go to quote, would he quote Hosea chapter 6, verse 6? So for the rest of the sermon, we're going to do what Jesus said to do, and we're going to go learn what that phrase meant. So before I start reading the context of Hosea chapter 6, let me give you, let me just paint the picture of where ancient Israel was at during that time. So Hosea was a prophet that preached in Israel about 800 years before the time of Jesus. And when Hosea came to Israel, he wasn't the first prophet called to Israel and he wasn't the last. He, and so the ones that have been called before, most of them were end up being killed. So just to give you an idea of the spiritual condition of where ancient Israel was at during the preaching of Hosea, they had abandoned the worship of God. Instead, they had taken on worshiping local, co local gods called the Balim. And these worship practices included having sex with prostitutes as part of a, wor a worship rite and included at times human sacrifice and included a lot of crazy things. And so when God had first made his covenant with Israel, he gave them a lot of commands, right? We've all heard the Ten Commandments. That was part of an original 613. So there were a lot of commands, <laughs> But the heart of the covenant that God sought to establish with Israel when he brought them out of, the e out of Egypt was this. You will be my people and I will be your God. And what God desired, all 613 of those commands, the purpose of them was to build an intimate relationship between God and his chosen people, Israel. And everything God done, he promised, listen, walk with me, walk in my ways, follow me and I will care for you. I will provide your needs. I will keep you safe in the desert land. And that was the heart of Israel. And though God again and again and again and again forgave them when they strayed away, blessed them, even in the midst of their sin, blessing them and helping pull them back, Israel consistently rebelled against God because they didn't want to do it God's way. They didn't want to do, do it the way God said to do it in his 613 commands known as the Mosaic law. And by this point in Israel's history, Israel had actually divided. They had a, not a civil war because it wasn't actually a war, but they basically had a civil war where they split the nation into two uh, during, the, during the reign of Rehoboam, Solomon's son. And the 10 tribes broke away. And these 10 tribes, when they broke away, they forsook God, they threw him out the window, they started doing everything opposite. And it led, it led to some of the religious corruption that I told you before, but it also led to a lot of widespread social corruption. And you had neighbors exploiting neighbors. You had the rich running the poor out of town so they could take their land. There were a lot of problems in ancient Israel. And God had sent multiple prophets trying to convince them to repent. Instead of repenting, Israel killed them all. And so Hosea was pretty brave. Hosea went to Israel with a message that other men had gotten killed for speaking before, and he spoke it again. And so basically in the first, you can go read it. There's you know, not enough time for us to go through all of it today. But that's what Hosea basically lays out in the first five chapters of the book. He lays out all these sins that Israel has committed. And in chapter six, you get to hear the response of the people. And they, the people respond in verses one through three. It says, come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. Thank you, baby. So, appreciate that. Thank you very much. Everybody, need, behind every great man is a great woman. I appreciate it, baby. Thank you. But 
okay, on the face of it, this seems pretty good, right? If we're talking about a message of repentance, look at some of the phrases that Israel says here, right? Let us return to the Lord. Restoration, healing, bind up our wounds, rest, you know, live in his presence. Let us acknowledge him. Let us press on to acknowledge him. This sounds pretty good on the face of it. And here's where I want to start getting to the heart of the sermon. Here's why Jesus quoted this passage to the Pharisees. I'll leave you to guess whether or not these words are sincere. The point I want to make here, right? There's a bunch of phrases in our world today, right? You got to walk the talk, put your money where your mouth is, actions speak louder than words. There's a bunch of phrases we have that basically denote the idea that I can say one thing and do another, right? I can say one thing and feel another. You know, uh, uh, like Hallie just brought me, if I were to stand up here and say, I'm married to Hallie, doesn't matter how I treat her, doesn't matter what I do to her, as long as I say I love you and I'm sorry at the end of it, I'm great. You know, that no one would look at me and say that that's a heart of true love for your wife. And that's the heart that Israel had here, because after they spoke these words, they didn't repent. They didn't change a thing. They kept on with their, you know, prostitution, which was spiritual adultery by worshiping other gods outside of the covenant they made with Yahweh. It's also physical adultery because you're having physical sex with a prostitute. They continued having human sacrifice and a whole bunch of other things, but they thought they were still still okay. They thought that they were fine and that these words were still good because of this. They thought that they were okay because of sacrifice. And now we're going to get down to what God meant in that phrase, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. So I've listed some things here. I've given you a picture of Solomon's temple as it would have appeared during the day of Hosea. And I want to call your attention to the altar they had at the front. Because of those 613 laws that God gave Israel, a lot of them had to do with sacrifice. And the purpose for sacrifice originally was this, right? God is perfect. God is holy. God is without sin. And so the second that something brings in sin, a separation goes up. That thing of sin is removed from God's presence. And so that's really the problem of sin, right? Is that as human beings, it's impossible for us not to sin. You know, even if you want to argue, I've never killed somebody, I've never murdered. The second that we commit the slightest infraction, we're now below that standard of perfection that God has. And so it sets up this wall between us. And if God didn't want a relationship with us, having us cut off from his presence wouldn't be such a problem. But the problem is God does want a relationship with us. And so he has this issue. How do I get these sinful people back in my presence? He still has to be just. He can't ignore sin. He can't pretend like it doesn't happen. He can't call everything good when it's not. So how do I be just? And how do I solve this problem of sin separating me from my people? And so God created this system of sacrifice, right? Romans 3.23 says the wages of sin is death. And so what that means is sin has to be paid for in death. And that was the point of Jesus coming on the ultimate sacrifice for everybody on the cross, right? The righteous for the unrighteous, perfect God himself spending his blood for sinners. But in order to prepare people to receive that sacrifice, in order to prepare that heart, God created a structure of animal sacrifice for the ancient Jews. And he had them sacrifice different types of animals in different types of ways to cover their sins. And God's like, I'll accept this blood as a temporary holdover until the time of the Messiah is right. And so that was the system. That was the structure. And sacrifices came to become a huge moment, right? Like we have in our culture today, we have the Super Bowl, right? We have music concerts. We have huge cultural celebrations that we do. Back in the day of the ancient Jews, sacrifices and special feasts became their massive cultural celebrations. So generations after they lost the Torah, generations after they stopped worshiping Yahweh, the ancient Jews were still doing their sacrifices. And so their attitude, to call back to the heart that I mentioned with Hallie, where I, you know, if I were a husband that says it doesn't matter how I treat her, I'm good just because I say I love you and I'm sorry at the end. The Israelites thought they didn't have to change their lives. They thought they were still okay because they did the sacrifices. So at the end of the day, we're sacrificing. God forgives us. He's never, and they also thought that because his temple was in Jerusalem, he would never let anything bad happen to the temple of his name. And the funny thing is, it's obvious to see, you know, here's the funny thing. My message today, it's on sincerity, right? It's on being genuine. And the funny thing about sincerity, I spent all week and even last week trying to figure out exactly what sincerity is, right? I was trying to find, I like to write. I was trying to find the exact right words that define sincerity and I couldn't do it. I stand before you today. I tried, I spent hours and hours and hours. I couldn't find the right phrase. So it's very hard to define exactly what sincerity is, but on the other side of that coin, it's also very obvious, right? You either are or you aren't. 
And so what God brings up here in Hosea chapter six, in verses one through three, we saw Israel's response, right? They give lip service. And if you were to look back at what they said, they weren't really sorry about their sin. They weren't talking about their sin. Most of it was looking forward to how God would bless them, right? Oh, after two quick days, we've done all this for years, but in two days, he'll forgive us. He'll bring restoration. Here's God's response in the next three verses to Israel. What can I do with you, Ephraim? Another word for Israel. What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. Therefore, I cut you in pieces with my prophets. I killed you with the words of my mouth. My judgments flash like lightning upon you, for I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. And so here's the heart that Jesus was quoting to the Pharisees. What he was telling them is that they're off base. And so I'll quote first to the ancient Jews, and then I'll bring it back to the Pharisees. But what God was saying here is he's telling ancient Israel, stop. I don't care about your ritual sacrifice. If you're going to be with me, be with me genuinely. Otherwise, don't be with me. Right? God's saying, I would rather that you stop sacrificing human beings. I would rather that you treat each other well than give me another sacrifice. I'd rather that you genuinely acknowledge me in your heart than light me up another burnt offering. And what he's trying to expose is the insincerity of ancient Israel. And that's what Jesus was trying to expose in the hearts of the Pharisees. Because if you look at that heart of God, right, a heart that says, I desire mercy, and you look back at the Pharisees' attitudes towards the tax collectors, there is no mercy there, right? You would think that if the Pharisees, as the religious elite of Israel, they should have looked at the tax collectors and said, let's help these people. Instead, they looked at them and said, they're swine, which in you know ancient Judea, they didn't like pigs very much. So that was a big, that was a big thing. We will not interact with them. So now I'm going to bring it back to the spiritual condition of the two. Because what Jesus is trying to show the Pharisees is the sins of ancient Israel were obvious. I know I didn't go into them too in depth, but if you want, you can read the first five chapters yourself. There was obvious sin there. And sometimes that's true for us, right? Sometimes it's obvious that we're not sincere in our faith because there is obvious sin in our lives that counteracts what God says. Not so for the Pharisees. If I read you that list, right, nothing in that list would have jumped out as sin or as that's egregious. That's an awful thing to do. And so the reason why Jesus quoted this specific passage to the Pharisees, is he's telling them this point, even though the sin is not as obvious in your life as it was for them, your heart is in the same place. Because I want to look, I told you before, right, that was an early interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees in Matthew chapter nine. Jesus wasn't even around for a year yet. Over the course of his three-year ministry, he had many interactions with the Pharisees and animosity increased on both sides. So let's look at some things later in his ministry that he said about the Pharisees or that he said to the Pharisees. In Luke 20, verses 46 through 47, Jesus said this, beware the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. Matthew 23, verse 27, he says this, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You, you are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and every unclean thing. And so Jesus' condemnation of the Pharisees here is I read you that list of things that the Pharisees did. The funny thing is, if you were to read the Old Testament cover to cover, not one of those is ever a command that God gives. You'll never find a command to lick honey off a scroll at two years old or to memorize the Torah by 10 or to fast twice a week or to tithe on 10th of your total possessions. And you see here, Jesus exposes the heart of why the Pharisees truly did those things, right? I think if the Pharisees had done those things because they genuinely loved God and it was their way of expressing sincere worship and love of him, God probably would have been okay with it. He probably would have said, okay, it's a little strict. It's a little intense, but I accept it. But that wasn't why the Pharisees did it. The Pharisees did it because they loved the status it gave them in their society. They did it because they loved the exaltation and the acclaim. They loved the front seats at every festival, right? And Jesus throws a little dig. James 127 says, the only religion worth anything is the care of widows and orphans. And Jesus highlights that a little bit when he throws in the, they devour widows' houses, just to show the heart. 
And the other thing I want to import on here before I jump into my final point for the day and we'll go into our time of communion is I don't know Evan's heart, right? I don't know Logan's heart. I don't know. Sometimes I don't even know Hallie's heart. She's my wife. I don't even know my own heart and I'm me. Sometimes when you put on a very religious exterior, right, you can have two sides of the coin. You can be like ancient Israel where your sin's obvious for people to see, or you can be like the Pharisees where it's very hidden and your exterior may actually be very religiously impressive. And humans can get fooled by that. They can't see through the whitewashed exterior. You can get fooled by that, but God is never fooled by that. God sees right through it to the heart. And I'll tell you this right now. The Pharisees were about as rigid as you can get. They were more rigid than any of us will ever be, I promise you. And it was not impressive to God. And the point I want to make to you is Christianity, being a disciple, it's not about impressing God with what you do. God cares about what you do, but he cares so much more about why you do. And he will always look through right to the heart. And what he's telling the Pharisees is, I'm not impressed by your exterior. Inside, you're dead. You're spiritually dead. So we're going to bring it in for a close today. And I want to end it with what does it all mean, right? Why should you care about the heart of ancient Israel? Why should you care about the heart of the Pharisees 2,000 years ago? Why does it matter to you here today in Camarillo in 2023? Here's why it matters. Micah 6, 8 says this, he, referring to God, has showed you, oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And so I want you to, if you've been, a, if you're not a disciple today, that's no problem at all. I just want you to stop and understand something about the heart of God. And if you are a disciple today, whether you've been one for one day or 50 years, I want you to let this be fresh in your heart. But over and over and over again, when God was given the chance to say, what's really important to me, look at what he defines in Micah. He says three things. Act justly, right? It's important to me that you do right by other people. Love mercy. Be good. Be kind. Be forgiving. Be generous. And walk humbly with me. You know, you don't tend to walk with people that you're not intimate with. I mean, think about the last time you took a long walk with a stranger. That's the kind of relationship that God wants with us. He wants it to be a relationship where we're step in step, where we're walking side by side together and where we're intimate. Bringing it forward to the New Testament, Jesus in Matthew 22, verse 34 to 40, has yet another interaction with the Pharisees. And this one comes right at the end of his life. This one, he's, he's come to Jerusalem. He's in the final week of his life. He's about to go to the cross in a few days. And he's teaching in the temple court, not far from that altar that I showed you. And while he's teaching, this interaction happens says, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, remember how I said the Pharisees were one of the two most dominant groups, Sadducees were the other, it says, hearing that Jesus silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. And I want you to recognize what this says about the heart of God, because this was a chance where God in the flesh, out of his own mouth, got to answer the question, what's most important to me? His answer could have been, pay me all your money. His answer could have been, grovel at my feet, beg mercy, and the second you do something wrong, you're out. His answer could have been, you're never going to stop worshiping me. I don't care if it's boring for you. I don't care if you don't like to sing. I don't care what your interests are. You're going to do what I want you to do, or I'm going to smite you. His answer wasn't any of those things. His answer was, love me through and through. And out of that love, do right to the people next to you. And so what I want to encourage you with, if you've been a disciple for any amount of time, this is not a sermon on necessarily going and doing more things. What I want you to reflect on is how genuine your faith is, right? Do you love God with that through and through type of spirit? And I have a few questions I want to leave you with here today. My encouragement is please, you know, tomorrow's Monday, tomorrow the work week starts, tomorrow the kids have plans. So try to reflect on this today, just at some point before you lay your head to your pillow. And I want to ask you two questions. And the first is, are you happy as a Christian? I think we talk a lot about different things we have to do and different requirements of Christianity, and it's good, and we should. But when God got the chance to answer his question, what well, God's heart, it wanted to be a loving, happy connection. When he got to define his kingdom, Jesus said it's a kingdom of righteousness, joy, and peace, right? Very similar to what Micah said. It's a kingdom of doing what is right, 
but it's also a kingdom of having joy and it's a kingdom of having peace. And I think that God genuinely wants to give us a lot more joy and peace than we allow in our lives because we make our lives more about doing things than we do about really genuinely being with him. And so if it's been a while since you've been happy in your Christianity, I would ask you, well, how sincere has it been? When was the last time that you genuinely let yourself be refreshed by God's love and then refreshed in love for him? And the final question I want to leave uh, with you today is a question of, are you sincere still? Right? If you've been a disciple, I think this challenge gets harder. I think the older you go as a disciple, I only have a few years myself. It's already gotten hard. So for those of you who are 10, 15, 20, 30 plus, hats off to you. But I think, you know, just like even in marriage, right, God calls our relationship with him. It's very similar to a marriage. And what can happen is what was at first life-changing and extraordinary can easily become ordinary. And so I just want to ask you, is your faith still genuine? Is it still genuinely happy? Because the answer to that question will in large part determine whether you live in religion or relationship. We're going to go ahead and bow our heads for a communion. And then I think, I believe Logan's going to come up for a brief contribution message. If you don't have a communion cup, they're on the table on the other side of this curtain. If you need one, um, just to let you guys know. All right, let's pray. Father God, I thank you for uh, giving me a voice today because when I woke up, I did not have one. <laughs> so I appreciate that, Father. Um, and I just pray that you would just really let this message be, re be refreshed, God. And I just want to thank you for your heart, that your, your heart is really to be with us that you really do desire a relationship. And on that question of sincerity, Father, you are never insincere. You are never halfway in your love for us or your promises or your deliverance. And so, Father, I just pray, you know, the beautiful thing about you, God, is Christianity can be tough. There can be a lot of things going on. Life always gets busy. But at the heart of it, what you want, God, is you just want to take that walk that Micah talks about side by side. I thank you, Father, because you're the perfect God of the universe. There's nothing we give you that you couldn't supply yourself. You know, life, God, if, if you were merciless, Father, if you demanded perfection, it would be better not to be born. Life would not be worth living. But because you love us, because you are gracious, God, life is worth living. And so I just thank you for your character and your heart. And I just pray for each one of us here, whether we don't know God, whether we've recently become a disciple, whether we've been one a long time, that you would just help us to really connect with how much you love us and who your heart truly is, Lord, in a very sincere way that has power in our lives and the lives of others around us. So in your name we pray, amen.